is nothing wrong with your radio. Do not attempt to adjust the volume. We are controlling the broadcast. For the next hour we will control all that you hear. You are about to experience the knowledge and insights of the media mothership. Got my mics on now. All right, welcome to H Radio 99.3 FM. This is Media Mothership. I'm Dr. Craig Norris, and I'm joined today by my special guest, uh, Bliss Sandu. Is yep. that close? It is perfect. Oh, you oh, nailed it. Sorry. Probably said it a bit too loud, though. <laughs> um, who is a PhD student from the Media School, uh, which we've had, who we've had the pleasure of having on in the past. So we're going to deep dive a little bit into his project, as well as some debate, discussion around... AI and imagery. Uh, so all that and more coming up on Media Mothership. As everyone knows, Media Mothership explores the way media shapes our understanding of the world around us. Hopefully we're streaming as well on YouTube and Twitch. I'm never sure. <laughs> Fingers crossed, then, eh? <laughs> I mean, there's been one or two hiccups already, but uh, uh, you can find us by searching Media Mothership. We're also streaming uh, via the old-fashioned FM signal in Hobart and streaming globally via edgeradio.org.au. If you have any questions to ask us while we're on air, you can uh, send us a message on the YouTube or Facebook chat or SMS us on 04 uh, so, uh, sit back, enjoy uh, the fantastic discussion coming up any second of uh, imagery and pop culture. Are you defined by the binary oppositions? Ever doubt a life of stable meaning? Want to trace it all? Edge Radio doesn't just offer you media. We offer you Media Mothership. Media Mothership, designed to reveal the aporias of today for one hour of difference. What are you waiting for? Hop on the media mothership. Yes, media mothership. <laughs> it's Radio 99.3 FM. Bliss, it's fantastic to have you on the station. It's uh, a pleasure to be here once again. Great. Uh, thank you for being calm. <laughs> this. That's one thing I've learned through my uh, experience in video production and photography and stuff like that. Like nothing will go right on the day of production. So just be calm and just solve the problems. And that's what I try to teach my students at the media school as well. Because, of course, yes, you're a, uh, the, one of the tech officer. Tech officer at the media school. And I'm a PhD candidate over there. And I'm also a videographer and a photographer by profession. So... Yeah, like a lot of, uh, you know, around the production sets and those sort of things that yeah. Yeah, go on in my life. So problem solving is the first skill that you have need to have. And calm is the only skill you need to have to be a uh, videographer or photographer, in my opinion. Just be calm. <laughs> That's it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Keep breathing. Yeah. Exactly. And um, while we're on this topic, I do want to set you up with a bit of background, but now that we've opened up the Pandora's box of things going bad, uh, what do you do when things go bad? What are some of the things that have gone bad? I mean, or have just like not gone according to plan? Is there something that, that stands out that comes immediately to, to uh, mind? Not at the top of my head, but every single uh, production set that I've been a part of, uh, something has gone wrong. So maybe the camera's not working. Some, uh, yeah, one thing that comes to mind right now is once I was shooting on a Canon video camera, and those are a bit tricky because sometimes if you don't close the uh, the door behind the memory card slot, it won't record. And that's a very right. Canon specific problem. And if you're not shooting on Canon quite a bit, you probably wouldn't notice about those things. But yeah, so they have like a tiny glass sliding door at the back of their thing, uh, at the back of the camera, which you just have to slide. And then it starts recording. Otherwise, it won't <laughs> record. And I had to send a message to one of my colleagues. I was like, what is it? Why, why does it, you know, not record anymore? He was like, are you using Canon? I was like, yeah. He was like, just close the door. I was like, cool. Yeah, and there you go. 
this like you this this will this will be a problem because you're not even recording anything right? <laughs> it's, but you're aware of it at the time right there's nothing worse than probably you know you're you, you think you've recorded something and then you look back over it and yeah 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 so yeah uh that's like one of the smaller things that comes up but then there are bigger issues sometimes like the lighting is not working or the audio is not working at all or yeah. something like that happens and there's a crisis situation so you need to have back off of a backup sort of a thing and yeah and that's where video production usually gets really really uh heavy in terms of equipment and stuff like that because you're packing heavy you got duplicates right or yeah you got backups, backups right? like so. backups of cameras back of, of audio of lighting of everything else because if you're going on a shoot in a different location then you don't have the luxury of just opening a cabinet and pulling something out that you need or you know yeah. replacing something so you need to have backups of backups and yeah because it's just one shot <laughs> that you need to get and you, yeah you need to be very uh creative and improvise solutions on the spot yeah yeah, uh, yeah exactly so being huh. calm is really helpful because you also have to realize that you are the tech guy over there when you're producing stuff but the person you're interviewing or you're working with or the other people they don't know what's happening and if you get panicked and then the whole set gets panicked up and then yeah the nervous energy shows up in the uh, content that you're producing as well so you just need to be calm and not sure that you are actually suffering inside <laughs> Have you uh, experienced uh, a ripple of tension starting to emerge in a production where suddenly someone starts getting really tense and it just cascades? Yeah, it shows up really soon on people we are interviewing who don't have media background or something like that because that's probably the first time in front of a camera and they are, you know, bombarded with all the wires that they're wearing and the lighting is on them. So they are center of the attention already yeah. and they are sitting all by themselves on a chair and they're already tense and if something else is not working then they feel like they might be the ones who are causing the problem and stuff like that so it's yeah. continuous reassuring that you're fine this just happens every time and yeah otherwise they start feeling like oh they are bringing bad luck or something like that so yeah it's like those sort of things happen all the time so you just have to reassure them that it's fine <laughs> so bliss's top three tips for reassuring the talent when everything's going wrong what would you suggest offer them water great idea compliment them as much as possible like you're wearing great fragrance you look great you have, you know you've already done so much better than other participants that we've had in the past or something like that like and give genuine compliment as well and very specific yeah. to them as well like not just make something up and yeah just try to engage in small talk of how the weather is outside or how the day has been so they get in the rhythm of talking to you and establish a bit of comfort and coming there a bit sooner is great as well so you can set up in front of them so they are familiar of how the process works and everything else and yeah most often than not you can crack a joke and then you can move on but yeah just stay calm yeah just that yeah. that I, I, again i, I <laughs> admire uh the people that are able to maintain calmness in environments where things are going wrong and i guess the 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 challenge there though is that multitasking because yeah. at the same time you're uh stay staying calm and getting the talent comfortable your mind's going 100 miles an hour trying to think okay how how am i going to fix this how am i going to yeah. solve this thing that's not working and it's only experience that you know calms you down in that situation and you can figure out an alternative and stuff like that but if you're not experienced enough then you're like yeah this is the end of the world like how am i going to record this thing but if you are experienced enough and you're like oh yeah these issues happen then i have a backup for this or i can do this alternative thing or we can improvise on the spot so it's good to start out as an attachment to a professional <laughs> and gain that experience yes gosh yes if you can have uh, uh as an apprentice if you can work with a master where you're able to not catastrophize because mm. i guess if it's your first time doing something or if you've placed too high an expectation on yourself yeah you can just start catastrophizing it as the worst thing in the world but yeah. and uh, what's interesting to me and and you know doing this show is always fun and training students to then do radio because i always reflect on uh things going bad right that, that actually when things do go bad in the studio the worst thing that can happen is i just go to the system to play music yeah. right and yes it's a shame because you know the guest mm. or the youtube stream won't work but you know it's not as if i've taken the radio station off air yeah exactly <laughs> you know, it's yeah. not as if i've caused a true catastrophe 
And sometimes, yeah, facing something which is at first seemingly ca catastrophic and realizing actually, yeah, I survived and uh, I, I've learned from that. I guess it's very important to stay healthy. Precisely, mentally. yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, you can always, in some situations, you can always count on a second shoot or a second sort of a thing. Like you can always do that again on another day or something like that. Might not be the practical advice in every situation, but in some situations, you can always rely on that sort of a thing. Like it's not the end of the world if I don't get this interview today. We can yes. convene in a week's time and still make it work and you learn from that experience and yeah, mistakes only make you stronger, you know. Yeah, as they say, the worst thing you can do is beat yourself up about it. Yeah. With uh, a lot of you know, self-interrogation and self-doubt. Just notch it up to good experience. I recall a quote by a martial artist, and he said, defeat is the secret ingredient to success. And I'm like, there you go, that's perfect. So unless and until you're not making mistakes, you're not really learning. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so. I, I remember another one. Uh, yeah, I succeed because I fail. Exactly. Right, that, yeah. that failure is the pathway to succeed. In, indeed, um, indeed. As this show hopefully will not demonstrate <laughs> in terms of, of, of failing. Um, but yeah, look, it is, it, is, it is one of these things as uh, a student, right, currently doing your PhD, where it should be all about developing and testing and pushing yourself in a space where you can make mistakes to learn from as a PhD student, so then you get recognized with successfully completing it as a, as a doctorate student. Yeah, or and I think those are very transferable skills as well because uh, if things go wrong in your PhD, you still need to remain calm and still show up every day and still write. Like you might have a bad day, but you just can't beat yourself on that and let the whole week be bad and then a whole month be bad. And before you know it, six months are lost and you lost on crucial time that you could have actually worked on. and created a, uh, uh, a chapter out of something. So yeah, just that perseverance sort of thing really I think is a very valuable skill, not just in video production, but also in like other aspects of uh, academia and life and in general. Which is why it's so exciting to have you on the show again, because I know a few months ago, uh, we had you in talking about the setup of your project, uh, which was all around uh, nature photography and sampling yep. Yep. A, uh, a sample set of uh, photographers yep. or amateur? Uh, it was just general audience uh, when they are photographing about the environment. So we were looking at how people post about the natural environment on uh, social media stories, uh, the feature that is, you know, uh, disappears in 24 hours. So That's Instagram right. stories like and stuff like that, ephemeral platforms. Yep. Yep. Yeah, so it's been amazing. It, <laughs> And as you're saying, this is specifically platforms where that image disappears after 24 hours. So exactly. it's a Snapchat type thing. That yes, in Instagram stories Instagram and Be oh, Real and those sort right. of things. Yeah, it's really interesting because one of the uh, themes that emerged in my interviews was people post stories, but then they save it on their highlights. And highlights is like a very hybrid sort of system because it stays there on your profile, but it's tucked away in a folder and people make folders based on themes. So if they've been traveling to like Bali and Tasmania and Sydney and those sort of places, they'll make different folders for it. Or they'll make one based on like outdoors, one based on parties, one based yes. on friends and families and stuff like that. So it's like a hybrid sort of thing. Like the story disappears, but then you saved it on your highlight, like archived it. So it's tucked away in yeah. a folder. If, and people can go and look back on it if they wanted to and press that uh, uh, folder and open the file, but it won't show up on your grid. So it's like a hybrid sort of a thing, like it's ephemeral and it's gone, but it's still tucked away and you've decided to keep it. And the participants were like very, uh, uh, it, it's such a nuanced usage and they told me that they do that for their own personal viewing. So it's like a public gallery, but it's for their own viewing. So they don't use their phone to pull out the photos and all those sort of things because it's just easier to go on social media and find which photos they posted in which particular uh, uh, folder and they don't go back and look at other people's highlights. Right. So it's like, it's a public thing, but it's like a social media etiquette that it's a private thing. And yeah, so it's a very hybrid space that's uh, working in a very intriguing way. I mean, it's, for me, one of the surprising things about our relationship with photography in particular, which this research is reminding me of is 
you know, pre-digital cameras, when you were just using your film stock, your Canon Fuji film thing that yep. you plug into your DSLR or your little Instamatic camera, yep. you had maybe 48 shots on there, 24 shots, something like 24 that. 24 and 36. 24, great, 24 <laughs> and 36. And you'd also be factoring in the kind of cost and time of getting it processed at a chemist or something. Exactly. Right? So each shot mattered. Exactly. Right? You, you wanted to get a shot that summed up the event you were going to or the trip you were making. Yep. Because uh, you only had 24 or maybe you only had two rolls of film, so maybe 48, and some of those might not work. And if someone blinks, you don't really know about it until yeah. later. So in that context, it was really precious to keep the photo, right? To do the photo and yeah. to have it, hopefully a good photo. Whereas the phenomena, it seems, of the, um, you know, the, the Instagram story or the Snapchat thing is at that polar opposite degree, which is all about the superfluousness of, of imagery, that we've got so much, it's so abundant, that the only thing that makes this image interesting is that it's going to disappear in 24 hours. Yeah, no, it's, it's amazing. But uh, So I was reading about some scholarship on stories by uh, some great scholars on the mainland, and they were talking about how when this feature was introduced and the promise of ephemer ephemerality meant that people can post silly things and, you know, uh, a bit of content that they don't want yeah. everyone to see and stuff like that. But I think that was in the early days when they were still figuring out this new form of communication because until then, photography meant that once you've clicked a photo, you have it for good, right? Yeah. Be it on a film negative, be it the developed photo that you have, or be it the one that you clicked digitally and saved on your phone or something like that, like it's there and you have it on. That's right, and there was yeah. that dominant discourse of yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you know, be careful of getting employment in the future because people will be able to search your history and yeah, find yeah, images yeah. of you which are bad. The digital footprint as well. Like, yeah. yeah, exactly. But even if it wasn't shared with anyone else, there was still this idea that you have it. And I think you can still have the stories because they are archived and you can view them if you want to, but not a lot of people know about that. And um, But the idea of stories was like, you know, you can post silly things and those sort of things and it doesn't really matter because it's gone. But I think that usage has now transformed because people are getting used to that platform and it's getting a very unique sort of usage which is different to regular posts or regular photography and stuff like that it's very and precise behind the moment spontaneous thing like we've been doing to your right now life like i can take a photo right now with you and be like oh or not with you in particular just of this mic and be like oh so places on a right. radio show right now he's doing something podcasty technical so thing this sounds more like almost a mindfulness act like it's like me embodied in this moment rather than me worry me using this feature because i don't want to leave a digital footprint and fingerprint so i'm using this feature to yeah, yeah, yeah exactly Instead, it's yeah. a kind of you know i'm 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 in this space i want to be uh recognizing it exactly. so i do this short thing it's kind See, of it's mindful. so beautiful because uh, the scholars that I was talking about, they noted that the people post a lot of selfies and group of friends and stuff like that. But in my research, what I found was like there are no selfies <laughs> and people say their uh, their presence is implied in the authorship of the image that they've taken yes. the image. So they don't need to prove that they are there and stuff like that. So that's the sort of yes. technical usage of like, you know. Uh, how the social norms are formed around the technical usage of social media. So It's so interesting point, though, about you're present in the image through your authorship of it, so they won't appear as in a selfie, you know, set against this great, you know, Cradle Mountain image or something. They haven't done it as a selfie. They've done it just as, say, for instance, Cradle Mountain. But, you know, that's an interesting concept because, you know, as time passes... It, 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 does it just look like every other image of Cradle Mountain? It does. And it does. If it you does. were in it, it would be distinctly. And that's the thing. And they will post those sort of uh, the uh, if they are featuring in the photo, they are more likely to post it on their regular post than on a story, because story is just perceived as a space like what you are doing right now, sort of a thing. I see. Like it's a highlight of the day, and then posts are like highlight of your life or your month or six month period or something like that. 
and that's like how now you can see how that usage has totally segregated itself from other forms of photography because people are getting used to that new form of communication and the new social media etiquette is forming around that and and it's kind of emerging you're, you're, yeah, you're saying it's, it's kind of emerging yeah it's still in its i think uh, uh, in its early days and we are still figuring out how this will work in later uh, later down the lane and stuff like that but people like literally use the word like i feel cringed if someone posts a selfie on this story <laughs> right it's something that yeah. my mom would do on facebook or something like that but if i did that on it. my they're not doing they're exactly, not following yeah, the it's rules it's not in trend anymore and if you put any filters on your story or something like that that's also like wow. sort of frowned upon and it's also used as a space like it's it has to be posted within 24 hours of your activity if not right there and then so, right so if it's sitting on your phone from three days ago and you push it out as a story it's kind yeah of like, it wow. feels like yeah 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 it's so the time it has to be time essence yeah which you know again i i don't think it is mindfulness but it does remind me of some of the discourse around mindfulness that mm. you're 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 wanting to have a moment where you're recognizing the feeling of the wind against you the feeling of your feet on the floor something like yeah, that yeah, yeah. which is and like, it's really really interesting as well like the only participant that posted a selfie in my research was uh uh because they went to uh do some diving around uh, the east coast with a couple of other surfers and stuff like that and they had an accident and someone got lost for a few hours but they found oh, them wow. and everything was fine but then they just had a mentally uh you know uh, tough time dealing with it and they went away from the group of friends and they were getting a lot of messages if you're doing all right and stuff like that so they just posted a selfie of them sitting on top of a hill or something like that and just smiling and they were like yes. it wasn't even a selfie it was like a video and they just featured in it for like half a second and they just showed where they are and it was and they reflected it was basically to communicate to everyone that they are doing fine and they are in a safe space and everything else so it's like a mass form of communication as well but, but context very specific. personal as well yeah, yeah. i mean so if you're friends with them and you've been talking to them you know what the story means but to a general audience like you know yes. so yeah it's kind of the exception that proves the rule of not having selfies because that selfie is in a particular context exactly where so it's sort of a mass personal communication thing I guess personal, but it's mass. Oh, look, it's so exciting. I mean, it's always an exciting moment in, in, in sociological, anthropological, or, or, or media studies research mm. where you come across a phenomena where you reflect on how the engineers of this, the software engineers, the hardware engineers, would have mapped out a particular use and purpose of this function, as you were talking about. You yeah. know, it seems to have a good selling points around the discourse of not leaving a fingerprint from yeah, employment yeah, yeah. concerns but then when you start unpacking after a number of years or months actually how people use it sometimes you unearth these emergent yeah. experiences which are showing how users themselves are creating something unexpected out of this or exactly. setting up unexpected rules and guidelines and these trends i think they just form locally as well like what i'm doing in tasmania right now and i'm looking at how people post about the environment and outdoors and those sort of things it might be totally different in uh, say colombia or some other country or some other sort of thing like yes. and people from mainland who are in tasmania and i have been my participants as well were like our friends back home just post about parties or you know going for dinners and yep. lunches and stuff like that So it's a very local thing as well oh. so it's reflecting your cultural sort of norms and ideologies totally. and those sort of things yeah and what's interesting there is moments where you can tease out underpinning ideological structures of that society like it was always interesting that uh, someone was pointing out how you know the technology which enables surveillance cameras to be able to you know break apart oh it's this person now coming through the airport gate or something highlights the fact that this technology could be used for various purposes but a technology that's hyper fixated on surveillance and security will use that for this purpose like it's also really interesting to me that the idea of the computer actually preceded its invention in some way like the babbage camp uh, the babbage computer from mm. like the late 1800s mm. had the principles of a computer device baked into it way back then in the 1800s but was never followed up on yeah because the social cultural interests weren't aligned to no. using that as a tool to do anything with yeah and it wasn't until you know the the war period world war 2 period that 
this idea of using computational technologies resurfaced and then you know, spawned computers. Yeah, exactly. And I think that kind of speaks to how primitive technologies are coming back to life as well, like the vinyl, r vinyl records or CDs or film cameras and those sort of things. Like there's companies who are talking about bringing new film cameras to the market so that the prices of film stock and film cameras come down a bit. Yeah. Because and there's and a demand for that, yeah. Then the question is, yes, what's going on there when on the surface, hey, we've got this better technology, digital, yeah. perfect, you know, uh, 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 portable MP3 plays and so forth, streaming, everything on demand. Why are vinyl records selling strongly uh, and so forth? Yeah, and and I think it's just nostalgia at this point. And there's of, like uh, dumb phones now in comparison to smartphones, which is like just an older version of the phone that we used to have back in like early two thousands. So but it, it has can just buttons. It has buttons, and you can't really access social media on it, but it, you can access your emails and you can send SMSs and uh, take calls and stuff like that. But within that surface level explanation there might be a more troubling undercurrent of it's also reflecting a society that's becoming more concerned about personal security or something like like the 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 amount of information on the smartphone the amount of of unobservable data gathering and harvesting on a smartphone yeah uh, precisely yeah, that might be one of the issues or it might be just one of the coping mechanisms of them trying to limit their usage i don't know which is why this research is <laughs> happening right to figure out these questions so here we are now at your project you've um what stage are you at you you've you've been going so over that so i'm almost at the end of my second year i've collected all my data i've analyzed it pretty much all of it any preliminary uh, trends beginning to show up yeah so uh I categorized the participants' responses in like 14 different themes of behaviors and themes. <laughs> uh, like happy, sad? No, nah, so I based it on the usage, so how they use the space, stories of the space, the spontaneity and ephemerality of it, the role that they play, engagement with nature and photography, so how much photography is part of their engagement with the nature, and uh, content that they post usually, and uh, motivations and interpretations and political lineations and those sort of things. Will there often be text linked to the image? Or? So what they do is, uh, some of them do post some text, but, so there are like two sorts of stories, right? One is them posting s what they're doing at the moment, which is like, you know, going out in the wilderness and uh, on a hike or, you know, finding those secluded spots like the treasure hunt moment or living the best as life and those sort of things. And then the other part is where they are resharing a persistent post, a regular post from an organization like a Bob Brown Foundation on their story for an environmental cause. And because I let the participants decide what they feel an environmental story is, so they posted those sort of things as well and they shared it with me and they posted the beautiful landscapes as well. So they post a bit of uh, text on the political stuff that they reshare from other organizations and post a bit of a personal commentary on there sometimes to give a more context and personalize the issue and get their friends to engage with it. And on the landscape stories, they are not as likely to post any text so that it doesn't distract from the image. Yes. But they might just tag their friend uh, so that they can also reshare it on their stories later. Otherwise, you can't reshare it if you're not tagged. And has most of this data you've looked at fallen into your expectations of what you thought you'd find? Or I think there? it's a bit, still a bit too vast. And I think, uh, yeah, like I can see how, for, so I have mapped out how the communication happens on a subtle and passive level. So how stories are interpreted and stuff like that. So one of the examples that I can give you right now is, uh, people who identify as greens but they don't want to be perceived as greens and the reason is because they post a lot of environmental landscape and them hiking and stuff like that and they don't want the connotations to be attached to the environment so it, they don't want it to be seen as like only greenies can enjoy the environment and post about it and stuff like that so they don't want that political uh, connotations attached to their stories and everything else and they want to remain separate. And then on the other uh, end of the spectrum, you have activists who are 
putting out those really vocal posts on uh, you know logging industry in Tasmania and sustainable timber and those sort of things so it's really interesting like they are actively constructing their identity either avoiding uh, sharing certain content or by sharing certain content so you have one community it sounds who are weaponizing this space yep. politically and assertively and they they're going in with an image deliberately crafting or choosing it so that it will be weaponized for a a a pro environment so they they can share that idea but the interesting thing is even they try to balance out because they know that their audience is kind of turned away because now we come to the interpretation of it so the political stories are not because the people who agree with them they don't really care about it because they are already on the same page and they've read about it <laughs> so they skip past it and the neutral people are just annoyed by it because they feel like social media is the personal space and you bring those strong opinions on it and you ruin their day <laughs> so they just skip past it so it's not really helping anyone so they you know, themselves noted that and said that they post more landscapes to balance that out so that people are not just turned away from them and don't just unfollow them so it's like a really interesting dynamic how stories are interpreted it isn't yeah look and it is fundamental to the act of communication yeah. isn't it? i mean way back in the day we had um oh who's the theorist the the negoti- dominant negotiated Stuart Hall yeah Stuart Hall's theories of dominant semiotics. negotiational and oppositional yeah uh so aspects of that of course are here but i imagine you're you're further elaborating from yeah i think it's a bit hard for me to talk right now because it's still i'm still writing my chapter at the moment so yeah but it's those sort of things like you know so when people see a person posting their uh, story they associate the presence and the place and stuff like that but it's also starting conversations in real life so when they see them next and they're like oh i saw you were uh, at lake st clair or something like that how was the weather how was that and they find more meaningful stuff to talk about uh, more common stuff to talk about and it's an icebreaker another thing that's that's a pretty good example of how passively they've communicated yes. before and then they just use it as a reference for when they meet next in person or something like that and yeah i think that sort of communication i can uh, i can see the trends how that sort of communication takes place and uh, connects people and uh yeah uh, it's such an interesting project because i think it is coming along at such a perfect time to talk about how images are not neutral right any mm. image is going to have either consciously or subconsciously a purpose to it a, precisely you know like as you're mapping out the i i think uh before you go any further i'll just mention the small things so one of the things with the stories people submitted to me was their perspective on the environment and how they perceive environment so some of them didn't have any humans in their photos and when i talked to them about it and they were like oh because humans ruin the photo and stuff like that and it's the view so that indicates a very utopian environmental view yeah. that without humans and stuff like that and Non-entrous. the other people were like we added our friends because environment is with us and it's as much as a social thing as anything else and this feel that humans are pretty much a part of the environment and not excluded from the environment so it's a very concentric sort of approach and uh, ecocentrism that has uh, emerged in that sort of uh, ideology and it can be exciting participating in research like this where some participants might become for the first time aware of th- an ideology they have or an opinion they have precisely they thought wasn't there i think that's why photo wars is such a crucial tool because the subconscious mind comes into play of what they're photographing and i didn't ask them to photograph anything like even if they didn't yeah. submit anything they could still participate in the study and yeah so it's really interesting how their world view has been reflected through that imagery I like is the environment only beautiful landscapes is it also plastic bottles in a notion sort of a thing so yeah I mean it's such an exciting project I know part of uh, the question I'm going to ask is outside the current realm of your project but we have about 5 10 minutes left so I couldn't let you go without talking about AI yep and images and in particular I want to talk about it in the context of this fascinating article that's uh, been posted up in Ars Technica, ARS Technica, from the University of Chicago, where researchers have found a way to poison AI art generators with this software they're calling Nightshade. So to explain how it works, basically 
uh, Nightshade was, it seems to be, I, I, I don't know the, the tech behind it, but it seems to be this bit of software uh, tool which researchers have uh, placed within uh, images of like a dragon. There's examples here in the article, dragon, a house, uh, where there are, uh, as I say here, it's a poison pill tool which alters images in ways that are invisible to the human eye but they will corrupt an AI model's training process uh, so that as the AI is being trained on it, it will no longer be able to do the dragon. It will instead do meaningless images yeah. and so forth. And again, it's all about artists feeling as if they haven't got control of their work at the moment because of the type of stories we're hearing of the training practices of AI yeah. engines where they've just... Harvested yeah. from, you know, photo galleries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, look, sorry, big question. As a photographer, I am not really a big fan of AI because it's similar to my research. Like people are just figuring out how to use stories as a separate thing in itself and a separate form of communication for a very niche sort of usage and those sort of things. And I think at the moment, AI is just trying to replicate photography or replace photography and those sort of things. And I don't think it's it's really the best use of the tool and I don't think it's art. And if I people are using it as a shortcut. To, oh yeah, if they're just using yeah. it to, you know, uh, generate the same portraits that you can shoot with uh, an actual camera and lighting setup and all those sort of things, then it's not really the best use of the tool, is it? No. So I think it is still in its infancy. And, uh, it, years down the lane, we might get to see a very niche and specified usage for uh, AI art and there might be a more art element to it. But at the moment, it doesn't really have that thought process of why you are creating that art, what's it yeah. saying, and those sort of things. Like, it's just like, oh, I put a few uh, prompts in it, and this is what it generated, and this is what it reflects. And I don't think artificial intelligence is, you know, even that subject uh, objective anymore. I think it's very subjective of how it's uh, programmed. And I guess as evidence of this, we are seeing a lot of use of AI for stunts where a f world photography prize or art prize will be, there'll be a gotcha moment where the artist reveals, hey, surprise, this was an AI piece of work you've awarded the top yeah. prize for suckers. And it's very stunt based, right? Yeah. It, it, as you're saying, it's it's not actually furthering your feeling of what AI's potential is. It's just replicating an existing form. Existing trend. And there's not like, so art I think is not just related to the art piece itself. It's also the thought process, the conceptualization, the message that it's trying to communicate and the emotions that it's trying to communicate and all those sort of things. And I think that background work that the fine artists do, like the fine art people do, that's not there in AI yes. anymore. And well, there was, go for it. Uh, Tony, you reminded me there was a great uh, story about Nick Cave, the, the musician Nick Cave being sent a, uh, by one of his fans, sent him a, um, uh, a song in the style of Nick Cave that he got the AI to create. It sent in Nick Cave saying, hey, look what I got my AI to make you a song yeah. by you in yeah. your style. And Nick Cave just said, look, you know, uh, this is just horrible. It's, you know, no, no AI goes through suffering yeah. in the way a human goes through suffering. And, and because of that, these words are meaningless. And this it's just recycling the stuff that is already out there. Like it's not creating anything new. Like it's not creative if you think of it because it's just sampling from a pool of stuff that has already been done by other photographers or other creatives and stuff like that and tries to mimic that yes. and reproduces that. So all these visualizations that we are seeing right now from AI, most of that artwork has been done, be it in fantasy, be it in you know photographic reproduction or something like that. So it's not creating anything new of its own. And even if it's generating pictures of people who don't actually exist, it's generating in a style that is inspired by photography and painting, the lighting techniques, the compositions, and the uh, depth of fields, and all the sort of things. It's very primitive in terms of you know uh, the stuff that is already out there from the existing knowledge that we have. So I can't really say it's art because art is creative by definition. So I mean, yes, that's right. Look, and it does. Uh, it's, it's a tangent again, but it does remind me of people are saying that it, this is, what is it, the difference between artificial intelligence and um, 
that self-aware artificial intelligence. At the moment, this type of artificial intelligence is, is directed by human prompts. Yep. It will be a more substantial leap when we get AI itself thinking for itself. You know, that, that kind of self-aware moment of singularity, I guess. That will be That reminds me of the iRobot and all those other movies, and I'm not a big fan of that sort of thing. <laughs> I don't think it should have it, that it, autonomy. It, it, but, it, uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, so uh, do you use AI in your own work in any way? Yes and no. So I don't actively use it, but I've got this program called Grammarly. Oh, uh, yeah. So it basically used to be just correcting your sentences and stuff like that. If you missed a comma or, you know, there's a better word for one of the uh, uh, words that you've used, a better synonym. But now it has also incorporated that auto-generative sort of emails or, you know, make tone different and make it more make it sound more persuasive make it sound more friendly make it sound more official and those sort of things yes and i've not i i've used that as a trial to see what it does not as an effective tool of communicating or doing my work because i think i have uh ethical uh complications in that because i'm very anti-ai in that sense so i probably wouldn't use it for my workflow in any way shape or form but it's kind of sad to see how good it is. <laughs> oh, look, it, yeah, look, and it is, it reminds me of the debates centered around disruptive technology in history. Uh, I'm not saying that, that I, also, I also share your concerns around what could be flippantly called the dumbing down. Yeah. Because it always reminds me, it was Aristotle or Socrates who was bemoaning the invention of writing, mm. similarly, in terms of saying, you know, it comes at the cost of an oral culture, right? Writing. Yeah. And for, I think it was Socrates, right? So Socrates, born in an oral culture, mm -hmm. pre-writing, uh, and, and then Plato writing up how this, I might be completely misremembering it, but the, the idea being that the writing form you know, is incredibly useful, incredibly helpful. It externalizes information. You don't need to hold it all on your head. But as you become more and more used to writing, you don't use your brain as an oral culture does anymore. Of you know, And you hear these people who have these ways of remembering things in their mind without writing them down. But we have to make an effort to learn that mode now because we're a writing culture. Writing has, for better or worse, and many people would say better, I mean, it revolutionized and democratized Christianity, for instance, with the printing yeah. press and blah, 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 blah. But yeah, look, and it, similarly, it came at a cost, right? It wasn't necessarily a technologically determinist level up for everyone. It, it, it meant certain benefits of an oral culture lost. True that. Yeah, that's absolutely right. But the thing is, like, with writing and with oral and stuff like that, like, you still have some agency of what you read, True. what you write and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, these were human-to-human human disruptive moments. Yes. This is human-to-non-human uh, human yeah, possible Yeah, so the agency is shifting. Yeah. Like, humans don't have the agency anymore of, uh, you know, if the AI starts doing things automatically and has its own agency and stuff like that, then... Where do we sit? And are you finding many students are writing dystopic science fiction <laughs> narratives here? Oh, right? actually, that might be a very good thing to uh, observe next year because the current cohort wasn't really that. Because ChatGPT, I think, came midway this year and people yeah. were already halfway through their projects, so nobody really wanted to change anything. But I think there were a couple of pitches made about like someone falls in love with a ChatGPT uh, <laughs> uh, run account or something like that, like a social media account ran by chat GPT or something, and then they just fall in love with that character, and then they find out that it's actually not a real person. So I think it's a very similar form of storytelling that has uh, uh, happened in science fiction about robots and AI before, like humans falling in love with yes. artificial intelligence. I think it was, uh, what was the film? Her? Or she? Her? No, she? it was uh, another one uh, of Ex Machina, I think. Ah, yes, yeah. Ex Machina as well, yes. Yep, that one, I think, yeah. So it's a very similar sort of a thing that our students are recycling at the moment. But, uh, yeah, I think it's yeah. just a very interesting space. Uh, and um, with that kind of dramatic pause, <laughs> I'm so looking forward to having you on again in the future. So um, your project has a year or so left, right? With extensions, it could be two. 
Oh, don't say that. <laughs> oh, oh, I, we'll hopefully, get, it sounds by, like it's going to get wrapped Hopefully, up by this time next year, we'll be pretty close to submission. It'll be wonderful to have you on again. My pleasure. I would love to help you. I'd uh, love to be here again. Thank you, Bliss. Easy. Uh, where can people reach out to, Bliss, if they're really interested in this project? Is there a way they can reach out? Or That's a very good also? question. Uh, so, my official email ID is bliss.sandhu, S A N D H U, at utas.edu.au. So I think the email would be the official way to reach out if you want to. Uh, so yeah. people can, uh, that's at UTAS, so people can always search the University of Tasmania website. Oh yeah, if you just Media search School. my name on Google, the UTAS discovery page will come up and you can click on my profile and get my contact information from there as well. Excellent, and we'll put some contact details on the show notes for this episode. Thank Beautiful. you again, Bliss. Perfect, thank you so much for having me. Your pleasure. Cheers. Have a good one. Yeah, and uh, keep listening. Um, no K-pop next, but after that will be Adrian and You Can't Sit Down. Uh, if you've enjoyed the show, please subscribe and uh, leave a review on the YouTube page or Facebook page. Uh, if you've got any questions, please post them up on Facebook or Discord or Instagram or TikTok. I'm over all of them, Bliss. Uh, <laughs> and keep listening to Edge Radio. Uh, coming up next is is not K-pop. It'll be uh, Fight Back Time by Slotface and the Boys. Uh-huh.